So I'd like to thank President, fellow staff for the award of the fellowship and the opportunity uh, to present uh, research entitled Rescuing the, the Injured Brain. So our uh, research aims to address this condition, traumatic brain injury, aiming to improve the investigation, management and outcome for these patients. In essence, traumatic brain injury is caused by a number of uh, particular causes, road traffic accidents, falls, assault, and increasing interest in sports-induced head injury uh, and concussion that you've probably heard about. It is a very common condition, approximately one million attendances at emergency departments in England and Wales per year, and is the highest cause of death under the age of 40 years, and a major cause of morbidity in survivors. In essence, it's a a journey for a patient from the scene of an incident through acute hospital care to rehabilitation and hopefully reintegration into the community. Um, it has a very long history. Uh, this is Neolithic man. This is about 5000 BC where people undertook surgery to the skull. These patients survived because you could see healing of the, of the trephination. Taking that forwards, Hippocrates said no head injury is too severe to despair of, nor too trivial to ignore. In the Middle Ages, people trefined the skull to let out the evil spirits. This led on to the development of new surgical instruments. This is the predecessor of the Hudson brace for making holes in the skull. This was Percival Potts' invention to elevate depressed skull fractures. And then if we move to the 20th century, Lawrence of Arabia sustained a fatal head injury in 1934 and this led Sir Hugh Cairns from Oxford to design and introduce motorcycle helmets. Moving to the 1970s, improvements with CT scanning. The death of Ayrton Senna in Formula One in 1994 led to improvements in motorsport safety car design, and that translated into current road vehicles. And then after the millennium, the era of guidelines with the nice head injury guidelines, and very recently, within the last two months, the all-party parliamentary group on acquired head injury has convened. In essence, after a head injury, you can sustain two sorts of pathologies. This is a mass lesion, an extradural hematoma. This requires surgical treatment to evacuate it, and some of our studies have been to try and introduce refinements in the surgery for these mass lesions. But probably our greater interest academically has been in this condition of diffuse brain injury, where the blow to the head results in swelling of the brain confined within the the skull, so that results in increase in brain pressure, a reduction in blood flow, failure of cerebral oxygen delivery and energy failure, death of cells and further swelling. So we've introduced the, the technologies to, to monitor this situation in the brain, this cranial access device that sits, taps into the skull and places three catheters, a pressure monitor, an oxygen sensor and a microdialysis brain chemistry sensor. And using that we can measure brain oxygen pressure and chemistry over prolonged periods of time in patients in the intensive care unit. And particularly, we can monitor brain metabolism, so how glucose is metabolized by glycolysis to pyruvate acetate, where it enters the citric acid cycle where ATP is generated. And we can, we can monitor these processes and when they fail. So in large numbers of patients, we've looked at the relationship between changes in brain chemistry and the clinical outcome for the patient and defined some of the chemical changes that are associated with unfavorable outcome. And then the next step was to try and introduce therapy to improve the brain chemistry. So these are some of the therapies used on intensive care, insulin, glucose therapy, hyperoxia, hyperventilation, mannitol, and surgical uh, maneuvers. That's led to an international consensus meeting where this microdialysis technology is now used in 75 centres internationally, and particularly to look at the optimal delivery of glucose. But what we noticed is that in certain patients, glucose was not available. We couldn't get glucose into the brain, but these patients were still surviving and often doing well. And we picked up on that, and in fact, what we discovered was that in the absence of glucose, Strangely, lactate, which is really regarded as a waste product of metabolism, can be passed from the supporting glia into neurons, converted to pyruvate, and enter the TCA cycle, so actually generating energy from uh, lactate. 
There's a cohort of patients who don't have problems with their blood supply but have problems with their mitochondria not functioning properly in terms of ATP production. And in these, we're a different approach. We're actually administering succinate to the, to the patients. This is an important intermediary in the citric acid cycle and, again, encouraging results in these patients with mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's really the basic and translational side of the research. But in parallel with that, we're undertaking a number of large multicenter randomized trials of both surgical procedures and drug therapy. For example, a trial of dexamethasone in chronic subdural hematomas. And these multicenter randomized trials in parallel with comparative effectiveness in the research in the center TBI study, which is led by my colleague uh, David Menon in Cambridge. Probably one of the best things that's happened in British neurosurgery over the last five years is what we call the BNTRC, and that is the British Neurosurgical Trainee Research Collaborative. So this is the neurosurgical registrars coming together, forming a research collaborative. They run their own projects, audit research projects that they've published, but also in terms of training, we have a trainee PI in each of the multi-centers for the, for the RCTs, and that's been tremendous for, for, for nurturing the next generation. Talked about um, trephination earlier, and of course in the Middle Ages they were making holes in the skull to let out evil spirits, but maybe there is a role for making holes in the skull. And this operation, decompressive craniectomy, has been around for several years. As I said, the brain is tight, it's enclosed by the skull, so maybe one way to lower the pressure is to open the box, take the bone out and put the scalp back over the swollen brain, and that operation is called a decompressive craniectomy. So that is something that we have been doing. You can see the frontal bone has been removed. The scalp is placed back over the swollen brain. When it all settles down, we replace the bone with this 3D printed titanium plate. Is this operation effective? Well, we undertook an RCT in over 400 patients, 52 centers, 20 countries, and the results were quite dramatic. This operation had amazing impact in terms of mortality of patients, a big reduction in mortality, and encouragingly, 60% of the patients undergoing this procedure were USD or better. This is independent at home. So, but while 60% of the patients were doing well, of concern to us was that 40% of the patients were ending up in states of lower severe disability in vegetative states, which is deemed clearly unfavorable. So the next stage of this study is trying to identify why some of these patients are doing well and others uh, are not doing so well. And this is where we uh, move on to more advanced scanning. So this is CT, this is MR, and this is a patient who had a decompression but did very badly. And actually, when you look at the MR scan, it shows a pathology, a contusion in the brainstem fundamental in terms of recovery. Decompressing the brain in patients with brainstem injuries is clearly not the right thing to do, and we need to think of other ways of treating this. So where has this taken us? So it's really been a combination of formation of the British Neurotrauma Group, the Trauma Audit Research Network, led by Fiona Leckie in Manchester, big advance with the Department of Health Major Trauma Networks, guidelines, research translating into improved protocols for management, so this is the improvement in outcome mortality from brain injury from the year 2000 in this country to 2015. So we're now at odds of death at, at 0.37. So this has been, I think, very encouraging and, and a testament to the work of, of many people in terms of the management of traumatic brain injury in, in the United Kingdom. Of great concern to us now currently is that if you look globally, 89% of head injuries are actually occurring in the lower and middle income countries. And on this planet, 14,000 people die every day from trauma. It's an enormous number of people. And of those 14,000, many of them are succumbing from traumatic brain injury. So we have uh, commenced the Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. It is funded by the NIHR, and it aims to create a global registry to use systems engineering approach to increase our understanding of TBI Clare and new innovations appropriate for Elmix. So here's some examples. So back to Lawrence of Arabia, England, 1934. This is Chennai, India, 2016. You don't need a family car in India because you can get all four members of the family on the motorbike, but only dad is wearing the helmet. You are more likely to be taken to hospital in a van than in an ambulance. So working with the Indian government 
to introduce a network of ambulances located every 50 kilometers over, uh, uh, along new highways. So this, remember, is the predecessor of the Hudson Brace. This is the current version. In Zambia, there are two neurosurgeons. They are still using this for craniotomy and opening the head. We have a resident that's gone out to Zambia, taken an electronic drill, and this has revolutionized neurosurgery in Zambia. What about access to technology? CT is expensive, so we're looking at new technologies. We're doing this with the MedTech Cooperative that is run by my predecessor, John Picard, in Cambridge. These are some of the technologies, near-infrared portable scanner to detect blood clots, and this advance in ultrasound. Ultrasound we can use to measure optic nerve sheath diameter as a surrogate for intracranial pressure. Again, expensive, but it become much cheaper. This is an ultrasound probe, which is cost-effective because you connect it to your smartphone uh, for the display. And we're currently trialling this in Cambridge before disseminating it across a number of African centres. I just want to, to finish by, uh, you know, I've learned a lot about traumatic brain injury in my career, but what else have I learned? So this is my sort of extra tip, of course, success and failure. So I have two files of letters. There are many of this, you know, we've all received these letters in the post. I'm sorry to inform you this was unsuccessful, but probably the letter that I'm, I'm proudest of is this letter that came from the Academy of Medical Sciences. This was 2001 and came from Mary Manning, who was the previous executive director. And you know, I was very um, honored to be awarded, I think, the first PPP Academy Clinician Scientist Fellowship. Of course, PPP was the predecessor of the Health Foundation. So uh, this is a letter that I've certainly kept. So thank you for that. Finally, I would like to um, acknowledge um, several people and organizations, too many to mention, but there are certain individuals that I would like to, to highlight. The first is uh, John Picard, who is he's here. He is my predecessor in neurosurgery in Cambridge as the chair. He established academic neurosurgery in Cambridge and laid the foundations for, for his own and many future successes. Alistair Compston. He's uh, led the Department of Clinical Neurosciences, again, extremely supportive uh, of the development of, of academic neurosurgery. And the relationship with the NHS, absolutely critical. This was David Hardy, the medical director. The Academy, I'd just like to, to name, in terms of my clinician scientist, Patrick Maxwell was the registrar at the time. Keith Peters was the, w was the president and acknowledged the support of Susie Candy, Mary Manning, and, and, and now Helen. And finally... NIHR and MRC for supporting our trials. This is uh, Graham Teasdale, who is my mentor. He remains my mentor. He started in about 2001. To conclude, just to thank my family, my wife Elizabeth is here. Uh, the kids are not here, but this is them, uh, Tommy and Oliver, receiving a bit of mentoring on Lock Fine. Anyway, thank you very much for your, for your attention.